In this video, we're going to talk about chemical elements and uh, some of the properties of water. We'll talk about water shape and how it's arranged, as well as some of the unique properties that make water so important to uh, life on our planet. Um, before we get to water, though, let's take a look at some of the different specific properties that are really important, uh, specific elements that are important for the survival of most life on, on the planet. Um, some very frequently occurring chemical elements found in living organisms, and those include carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Those are the four main ones, um, but there are also a couple of others that are, are pretty common, and those include sulfur, calcium, phosphorus, iron, and sodium. Those are also needed by uh, many organisms to, to survive. Let's take a closer look at some of these uh, frequently occurring elements, and the first one's hydrogen. Um, hydrogen ions are used for active transport, photosynthesis, cell respiration. Um, they can also be used as a measure of pH, and pH is a measure of the activity of dissolved hydrogen ions. Uh, a low pH in our scale uh, are values of 1 to 6, and that indicates a high concentration of hydrogen ions, and we call that an acidic or an acid. And a high pH from 8 to 14 indicates a low concentration of hydrogen ions, and we consider that uh, uh, it's, a, it's a base. Um, a pH of 7 is neutral. Most uh, water is a pH of 7. Um, tap water is usually around 7.1, 7.2. And pH can really affect um, how organisms live. And so, especially organisms living in an aqueous environment, for a marine environment, for example, if the pH changes, either it gets too high or it gets too low, um, it can cause a major change to their environment and can interrupt uh, their ability to maintain homeostasis and can eventually cause them to actually die if, if the pH changes too much. And a great example of this is actually in the ocean. Um, Seawater is usually around a pH of 8.2, 8.3, somewhere in that range. And so if that pH gets too high or gets too low, it can cause problems for the marine organisms. Uh, it's also one of the foundation elements for organic molecules. Another uh, element that we're going to take a look at is oxygen. And oxygen is often used or is used during aerobic respiration. So during cellular respiration when mitochondria are taking sugar uh, or, or glucose and changing that into uh, ATP, oxygen is used in that process. And in eukaryotic cells, plants, animals uh, use oxygen in order for this process to occur. Um, and then the oxygen specifically is used to accept electrons. It makes uh, H2O water following the production of ATP. Uh, it's necessary to form water. It's one of the primary components or elements in water. Uh, carbon is our third atom or element, and that is one of the primary molecules found in living things. And it's found in things like sugars, carbohydrates, amino acids, proteins, lipids, fats, oils. Uh, it's one of the very basic and the most fundamental basic building blocks of living things. Um, and we'll see in a lot of the molecules that we look at in our next couple of videos that carbon plays a huge role and is a major part or component of those molecules. The last uh, frequently occurring element is nitrogen. And the primary purpose of nitrogen is the production of amino acids, and it's found in amino acids. Um, amino acids are combined to form proteins, and so proteins are produced in the ribosomes, and um, they are small amino acids put together to actually make a protein. There's a number of different forms in nature that nitrogen can be found. You may have heard of these before. Um, if you've had a fish tank ever, you probably measured some of these different levels. Uh, nitrogen, ammonium, nitrates, nitrites, urea. These are all different types of uh, or different forms of nitrogen that can be found um, in the environment. The other pr uh, purpose of nitrogen is actually uh, the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen filters through uh, environments through a, a number of different steps and mechanisms that can be found both in the atmosphere, in plants and animals, in the soil. Um, and, and the interesting part here, or the kind of the, the important part, is that different forms of bacteria are actually helping to break this nitrogen down and make it usable by plants. An organism comes along and eats that plant, and so then that nitrogen is passed from the plant to the organism. And so really this is kind of like the water cycle. Um, in that this nitrogen is cycled through different portions of the uh, environment. Some other essential nutrients include iron. Um, iron is used in animals as an agent to bind oxygen and hemoglobin. Plants use it to make chlorophyll and it's used in photosynthesis. It can also be a limiting reagent in a plant reaction. Here's an image of hemoglobin. Um, here's our red blood cell and if we zoom in or, or blow this up a little bit, we can see the individual parts, and iron is a portion of that. And so iron is being as, uh, is used as a, as a means to bind that oxygen within the hemoglobin molecule. Um, 
And then our plants, uh, iron is used in the chlorophyll of the plants. We'll take a closer look at photosynthesis and the chlorophyll when we get to our photosynthesis and respiration unit um, next semester. Our next essential nutrient is calcium. And in animals, calcium is used in the structure of bones and teeth and as well as blood clotting. Um, it's used in the production of an exoskeleton. So insects, for example, have an exoskeleton that's the, the external um, kind of their skeleton that helps protect them. Uh, calcium is used to create that. Um, one of the other important functions is calcium is it's also used, uh, calcium ions are used during um, synaptic transmission and sending nerve signals between different uh, nerve cells. And so calcium is um, one of the elements that's actually used to send that signal across uh, different nerve cells. Um, if you take anatomy and physiology uh, with Mrs. Gorka, you'll take a closer look at this, uh, at this process and, and how calcium is used um, in sending those signals. Our next uh, essential nutrient is phosphorus. And phosphorus is a major component of the cell membrane, as we talked about in our last unit. Um, phosphate heads help uh, make up the phospholis phospholipid bilayer. And so here's our phospholipid. Here's the phosphate head. Here's our fatty acid tails. Uh, this is one individual phospholipid. And so phosphate's used in that actually to make up that portion of the bilayer. It's also a component in ATP. And so ATP, we've talked about briefly and we will more, is the energy that cells use to actually do work. Uh, that ATP, the P portion, is referring to phosphate. ATP stands for adenine triphosphate. And so an ATP molecule has three phosphates. ADP, the, the, the form of the molecule that has lost its phosphate and has given up its energy, um, has two phosphates. So there's an ATP molecule. It's also used to help make up the backbone of DNA. We'll take a closer look at DNA this semester, um, but it's, it's helping to make up that backbone of DNA um, as well as sugar. Um, so we've got our sugar and then our bases. Phosphate is, is one of the, the pieces that helps to join all of that together. And then also it cycles through the environment through rocks and soil. Um, plants and animals are also a component in that phosphorus cycle. Um, and so that's one of the ways that this element can get cycled through the environment. Our next essential nutrient is sulfur. And this can sometimes be found in amino acids. It's not overly common, but it is occasionally found in some amino acids. Um, and it's a reactant, that, which is pretty cool, for uh, chemosynthetic bacteria found in the deep sea vents. So some of those deep sea vents, there's actual bacteria that are able to live and thrive in those environments. It's a very special, uh, unique environment. And these bacteria are using the sulfur found uh, to produce organic materials. So rather than using sunlight, um, carbon dioxide, and, and, and uh, water, um, so these bacteria are using sunlight, uh, excuse me, not using sunlight, they're using this sulfur rather than sunlight in order to produce uh, sugars and then sulfur compounds. Our next two uh, elements, nutrients that we're looking at are sodium and potassium. Sodium and potassium can be used in creating action potential for nerve impulses. And so the, a good example of this is found in the sodium potassium pump. What we see in this situation is uh, sodium ions are being pumped against the concentration gradient, so they're being pumped from an area of low concentration to high concentration. Uh, and with that, it requires energy. In order to move the sodium actually against the concentration gradient, it requires ATP. ATP provides energy to actually pump the sodium against the concentration gradient, and as a result of that, potassium is able to move in the opposite direction, again, um, uh, in the opposite direction in, inside of the cell. So let's talk about water uh, for a little bit. A uh, water molecule is made of two hydrogens and one oxygen. Uh, the oxygen carries a negative charge, and the hydrogens each a positive charge. So we've got two hydrogen atoms here. They both carry a positive charge. The oxygen has a negative charge. We call an o a water molecule a polar molecule because it has this separation or distribution of charges. Uh, the oxygen side of this molecule has a negative charge, the hydrogens have a positive charge. And so because of this, water is a polar molecule. The hydrogen and oxygen of one molecule held, are held by covalent bonds. Um, water molecules can actually bond and, and be held together uh, with one another um, by something called a hydrogen bond. And what we see happen here is, um, here is our, the red is our oxygen. Uh, here's our two positive hydrogens, and these are held together by a covalent bond. It's a pretty strong bond, uh, but we can also see 
two different water molecules bonding to, to one another, and that's through something called a hydrogen bond, as seen right here. And in this situation, it's happening between two different water molecules, and the hydrogen atom, uh, the positive, positive hydrogen atom of one molecule, is bonding to the negative um, oxygen atom of another water molecule. So here's another image um, that helps to explain this. Here's one water molecule right here. This is one water molecule. This oxygen has an overall net negative charge. Hydrogens have slightly positive charge. And so this negative oxygen is attracted to a slightly positive hydrogen charge. Covalent bonds between our individual single water molecule, hydrogen bonds between different water molecules. In comparison to a covalent bond, hydrogen bonds are weaker. Uh, covalent bonds are much stronger, but hydrogen bonds do provide uh, the ability for different water molecules to stick to one another. Some other properties of water that we need to take a look at, um, the first one is a thermal property. And water has a very high specific heat capacity. And what that basically means is it takes lots of energy for water to change temperature uh, because, of many, because of these many hydrogen bonds. So it takes a lot of energy for water to heat up or for water to cool down. And because of this, it creates a very stable environment. And so ocean uh, temperatures, although they do t change temperature, it takes a long period or a lot of energy for that to actually happen. Um, this is one of the reasons why we see less extreme climate change near large bodies of water. You think about on the coast, uh, although the temperature does change from winter to summer, we don't have as high of extremes as like we do maybe in the middle of the U.S. Um, in the Midwest, or it gets really cold in the winter and really hot in the summer. So water temperature remains fairly stable, and it provides a very stable environment for organisms that do live in the water. It's kind of a nice, funny comic that helps to illustrate that. Another property of water is uh, cohesive properties. And in this, uh, each water molecule bonds with four others in a tetrahedral arrangement. Um, so water molecules can bond with four others. Here's one water molecule. It's bonding with four others in this tetrahedral arrangement. So the oxygen has uh, bonded to, has through hydrogen bonds is bonded to two other um, water molecules and then the hydrogen bonds to each individually to a different water molecule. Um, it creates a pretty strong bond arrangement and what this allows or what this causes is water molecules to stick together and that's called cohesion. If water molecules stick to something else, a different type of surface, that's called adhesion. And so why this is important and what we see this in nature is something called capillary action. And this is what allows water to move against gravity due to cohesion and adhesion. And this is one of the ways that water can move up the stems of plants. It's traveling against gravity. gravity. It's traveling uh, up those um, stems and roots of the plants. And so by adhesion and cohesion, it's able to do this. Water also exhi exhibits a property called surface tension. And this is the water's ability to resist an external uh, force or tension. And this is one way that insects uh, can be supported um, by water and they can actually float and kind of skim around on the top of water surface. Another property of water is, uh, is that it's a good solvent. Uh, water dissolves many substances because it's polar. Again, polar means that the molecule has a separation of electrical charge. Um, and so because positive hydrogen uh, is attracted to negative ions and negative oxygen is attracted to positive ions, it can actually break down different uh, solids or solutes. Uh, water dissolving salt is a great example of this. Uh, the water molecules right here are being attracted to the negative and then to the positive. And so we have our positive hydrogens attracted to this negative ion, the negative oxygens attracted to the uh, positive ion here. Water is also a good coolant. Um, going back to the high specific heat of water uh, requires lots of energy to, for water temperature to change. And so water heats and cools more slowly than, on, than uh, air or land. And so water is actually a good coolant for this. Um, water evaporation removes energy from systems, providing a cooling mechanism. And it makes up a large part of the human body, obviously, and so it allows cooler blood uh, to circulate and provide a nice cooling mechanism uh, within humans. It's also a good transport medium. Uh, water provides a medium for particles to dissolve, move, and react. Metabolic reactions occur in solution, and so water improves the ability of molecules to dissolve. Our last relationship is um, 